Today, as we gather, we acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Haudenosaunee God and Anishinaabeg peoples, Treaty 29, 1827. And with this acknowledgement, we lift up the hard work of building, rebuilding right relations with our Native brothers and sisters. Good morning, people of joy. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Welcome, friends. It is with great joy that I am with you today in this time and space. And it is with great joy that I wear this Christmas top, my very first, made and gifted to me by Mary Bell. And I thank you, and I love it. I'm going to show it off. <laughs> The sunglasses that the camel wears, that's because the star was so bright. <laughs> Welcome to those who are gathered here in the sanctuary today and to those who gather with us and join us on Facebook Live and then some people watch later on on our Knox's YouTube channel. So welcome to everyone. As we deepen our relationship to God and to each other through our conversations, our singing, our praying and praise, may we strengthen, teach, and shape each other for the work that God calls us to out in the world. Join me now for our call to worship. One voice calls out in the wilderness. We can choose to ignore it. Instead, we come into this space. A voice calls out in the wilderness. Do you hear it? Let us draw near to God. I now invite Gord to come up. Good morning, folks. <clears throat> I'm sure all of you know who I am. <laughs> Fifty years ago or so, my wife Jeanette and I joined Knox United Church. <clears throat> Please join me in the lighting of the candle of joy. Joy is a celebration given by God. Joy, joy is a celebration on the earth of our Christ. Joy is a celebration <clears throat> when the angels sing, Glory to God in the highest. We celebrate glory for Christ. Let us pray. So is the light shining in our lives and in your world the bright light of the joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. and your leading. Open our hearts to the words of your prophets who implore us to remove any obstacles that are hindering our acceptance to the renewed ways of justice and peace that God has promised to reveal to us through the child to come. 
we pray with great anticipation. Amen. Let us sing now our opening hymn, Please Stand As You Are Able, Voices United 29, Part the Glad Sound. Let us pray. God, whose love is like the sun warming me from the inside, if you are my home, then your word is the streetlight guiding me there. So I want you to know I am walking your way. We are walking your way, and we are looking for a light. And our feet are dirty. We've lost our way a time or two, and our bags are heavy. We're carrying an array of grief and fear on our backs. But we're on our way. We're looking for your light. We're listening for your word. When you see us coming, when you feel our hearts move, we hope you'll run down the driveway and catch us. Leave the light on. We are on our way home. Gratefully we pray. Amen. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iteria and Trachonetus, and Lysanus, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. 
John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, you war who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the foot of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruits is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowd asked him, What then should we do? In reply he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with one who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. And they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them, saying, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chafe he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. I have to be honest with you and tell you that I really struggled with the lectionary scripture this week. I came very close to reading the scripture and then preaching on something completely unrelated. What do we need to take notice of from this passage? Jesus is not mentioned in it, nor is there any mention of hope, peace, love, or this week's theme of joy. Then, while I was thinking about the season of Advent and how we are all preparing for the birth of our beloved Jesus Christ, divine wisdom struck me. Very early one day this week, I literally woke up singing. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. from the musical Godspell, and I haven't been able to get it out of my head since it popped in. But it reminds me that this passage, just like Advent, is about preparing the way of the Lord. What is unique about this passage for this Sunday of the church year is the placement of John the Baptist in the context of world history, and that the declaration in John's words and deeds, is preparing the way for Jesus. In this scripture, we are reminded that God is at work putting everything together to bring salvation to all flesh. Much of the joy of Christmas is in the preparation and the anticipation of it. It's in this dimension that makes Christmas. The main event is the birth of the baby in the manger, the Christ child. But it's the getting ready that we experience the most joy, as well as we hold on to the most hope, calm ourselves in the most peace, 
and enjoy the sharing of the most love. Today, we can see similarities between the story of Jesus and the story of John. In ancient times, when a king proposed to visit a part of his kingdom, he would send out a messenger ahead to prepare the people that he was coming and prepare the roads. In a similar way, John is the messenger of Jesus, the king. The king is coming, he announced. But in this case, John reminds us that this work of preparing the way for Jesus is an ongoing call that crosses all times and places. We are called to this work in our lives all year long. Prepare the way. Jesus is coming. The kingdom is near. At the beginning of this new church calendar, we begin to hear from the gospel according to Luke. Luke is a first century historian who gives a great deal of detail about his context and the events that were happening in the world around him. Luke writes to make a point and to teach a truth, to draw people into the community narrative. And that's what Luke is doing here placing the beginning of the Christian story, a story that now defines, encourages, and challenges his community of faith, into the history of the world. Luke writes this, In the 15th year of the reign of the emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip the ruler of the region of Iteria, and on he goes. So I had to ask myself the question, what does the birth of a small baby have to do with this talk about kings, emperors, and governors? Why are we situating Christ's birth amongst a backdrop of empire and power? Well, Luke would likely reply that it has everything to do with it. This is the way it is with the Gospels. Much of the scripture seems insignificant on the first read, and some of the best parts are easily missed. This is what happened to me this week. Upon my first, second, perhaps tenth read, I saw very little. What I failed to realize is that this passage is a foreshadowing of two small babies, John the Baptist and Jesus. They are God's mercy that comes disguised as human weakness to vulnerable children who grow up to change the world. They both died at the hands of the Romans in very violent ways, but these two vulnerable children were also the means by which God planned to reconcile the world unto God's own self. So Luke begins the story by making the outrageous claim that God is at work in the weak and small. Babies and barren women and unwed teenage mothers and wild-eyed prophets and itinerant preachers and executed criminals to change the world. And to be quite honest, God's not done yet. God continues to work through unlikely characters today, on popular teens and out-of-work adults, in corporate executives and stay-at-home parents, and underpaid admin staff and night shift workers, and police officers who buy boots for homeless people, to announce the news of God's redemption. It's a promise, and as I said, it's easy to miss but when we hear it, and even more, when we see it taking place in our own lives, it changes us along with the world. John went out into the wilderness, away from the city, away from the crowds, to attract a great crowd out to him. He seemed almost determined to fail. But despite his locational choice, we learn that people from all over the region flocked to hear his message. His message from the wilderness in the wilderness. 
The wilderness for John was not a lonely and dark place. It was a place to be respected, but not feared. The wilderness was and is a place to revel in the silence. Wilderness time is a time to come close to God, a time to listen for the divine to enter in and give one strength. In the wilderness, John was given from God the words to speak to a people in despair. John reminded the people who followed him out into the wilderness, and he continues to remind those of us who gather here today, who are feeling the uncertainty of wilderness living, of the prophet Isaiah's words. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Could it be that he was trying to draw people away from their routines, their oppressive lives, the only reality that they had ever known, and give them an opportunity to see life from a fresh new perspective? Perhaps he was forcing them to let go of all they had known before so that they could make room in their lives for what was ahead. Prepare the way. One of my favorite poets is Wendell Berry, the Kentucky farmer poet who wrote, When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things, who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world, and I am free. John found his truth in the wilderness. People heard and responded to the truth he spoke. A child of Bethlehem, our Savior, our Lord, will be born among animals, and only lowly shepherds who sleep in open fields along with those animals will be there to see this child. John, the stable, the vulnerable baby king, the angels singing tidings of comfort and joy. The meaning of all these things are as true as the dawn hovering at the edge of darkness. John's message is a message of joy. It is more than a call to prepare the way. John actually suggests how we might prepare the way and create a home for all. John's call is for us to help in the creation of a kingdom where inequities are banished, valleys are lifted up, and all people have the resources they need for collective flourishing. John's message is a message of joy. None of us have to go it alone. We are all called to do the work together, the work of collectively building and repairing the ineffective, unjust structures of society. We are not alone. We do it together. And where we build, God is also there. John's message is a message of joy. He calls us to repent, which means to change direction. It demands a change of life, a change of heart evident in our actions as well as our attitudes. Repent, change, turn to a life of forgiveness and justice, God's justice for all. 
For those of us who are comfortable in our lives, we may not hear much good news in this message of repentance. We might just hear a call to a lot of work that has to be done. But for those who are suffering, for those of us who have lost hope, for those of us who are hurt by the inequities and injustices that are perpetrated by unjust systems, change is good news. And when, we are, when are we called to do this work? In all times and places, in the here and now. We are called to be ready. And as Elder Vilmarie Citron Olivieri writes, quote, bear fruit worthy of repentance, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, giving voice to the silenced and oppressed, speaking truth to power, and protecting and empowering the vulnerable. Let our collective voice cry out in the wilderness and everywhere, with exhortations and good news. And as the message is heard, more and more people will join us in the building of the kingdom of God, making it truly a home for all." End quote. John's message is a message of joy. The end of the scripture holds the gem for me personally. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. This means that no matter how small or insignificant you may feel, or how important or not you are, the message here is that all flesh, all people, all creatures will have salvation. God's mercy and love is there for each and every one of us. Do you sometimes feel overlooked? insignificant and small, surrounded by insurmountable problems, people, and challenges. Maybe it's not an emperor that makes life miserable. Maybe it's just a difficult colleague or an unhappy marriage. Maybe it's not Roman occupation that oppresses, but instead it's a struggle with addiction to alcohol or drugs or shopping. Maybe it's not governors that threaten to destroy, but instead it's a feeling that you're lost at school or work with no real friends. Maybe it's not rulers and priests that overwhelm, but instead a struggle with depression, grief, or loneliness. Whatever it may be, Luke shares the gospel promise that these two will pass. That in the end, they will be but a difficult and distant memory. That over time, they will become mere footnotes to a larger, grander, and more beautiful story of acceptance, grace, mercy, and life. The waiting can be difficult, which is why Luke reminds his community and ours of this promise that is so easy to overlook, but is big enough to save and powerful enough to transform. The kingdom we build together with God, there will be a home for all. And that is something to be truly joyful about. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us sing together hymn 44 from Voices United, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. <laughs>
I've asked myself that a million times in my life. How do I make a difference? Can I really do anything that could help this hurting world? Is it already too late? Is it already too big? It can feel overwhelming at times, but John says, if you have two coats, give one away. It's all that easy, and it's all that hard. So friends, let us give our tidings of and offerings now, knowing that these gifts will build a world we can all have a home in, where all are welcome, fed, loved, and known. What should we do? We should give what we have. It's all that easy and all that hard. May it be so. We are not passing the offering plates today, but you will find them just outside the sanctuary doors. Let us now sing. That's what this offering is. It's our second coat. It's our hearts on our sleeve. It's our audacious hope that there can indeed be a better world than this one. So take these gifts and use them to move us closer to that promised day. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. I have a few announcements. Um, this is the last day that we will be collecting gift cards to Walmart and Giant Tiger, as well as monetary donations for the Christmas Place in Woodstock, a program of Operation Sharing. Please see the details in our announcements, but also note that if you make the checks out to Knox United Church with Operation Sharing in the memo, it will be received, uh, you will receive a tax receipt, and the church will send in uh, a lump sum to the organization. Also, the United Church of Canada has a gifts vision book out, and there are many different mission causes across Canada and around the world that you can support through mission and service. And these are gifts that you give in honor of a special occasion, a birthday, or Christmas, any time throughout the year. These gifts that make a difference in people's lives. I'm going to read one of the programs that they support called Safe House, Safer Society. Human beings are not for sale. The Dionysus of, uh, let me see, Durjapur of Church of Northern India works near the border with Bangladesh, where human traffickers abduct children and youth living in poverty and force them into sex trade, domestic labor, or black market organ harvesting. Children and youth who are rescued or managed to escape are often disowned by their families. The Church of North India operates safe houses that offer compassionate care so the children can begin to heal from this unspeakable trauma. Also this Wednesday, December the 15th at 7.30 here at Knox United, I will be leading a Blue Christmas uh, service. This service is intended for those who experience difficult emotions during Christmas time and for those who want to show support for a hurting community. And due to the global pandemic, that covers just about all of us. Christmas can be a challenge for many reasons. Recent personal loss, job loss, depression, declining health, an association with painful Christmases past, separation from loved ones, or a feeling of intense disconnection from the prevailing secularism of Christmas. This Blue Christmas 
gives us time and space away from the hype of Christmas. And it's an opportunity to experience a sacred presence amidst our lives, which are sometimes awkward and uncomfortable and messy. In our darkness, we will light candles. So that's Wednesday, December the 15th at 7.30, right here at Knox. We will also be uh, showing the service online, live on our Facebook page, and later on the Knox Emerald YouTube channel. I also want to wish Evelyn Shute a happy birthday. Today is her birthday, so happy birthday, Evelyn. <laughs> And later this week, uh, Barb McIntosh's birthday, and Lara Martin Dow's birthday, and Catherine Greig's birthday. So happy birthday to all those people and anyone else. And are there any other announcements or birthdays or celebrations that you are aware of? Steve? Yes, very quickly. Would all the members of council who are here today move over in that corner right after? Okay, so we're asking that the members of council that are here today uh, to gather over in this corner behind the Christmas tree <laughs> after the church service um, for a quick meeting. Is that everything? Can we sing happy birthday? Can we sing happy birthday? Sure. Should we play it too? Can we play it? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. of God's people. God of open doors and porch lights, of welcome mats and candles in the window, we cannot thank you enough for your open door policy. You are forever welcoming us home in a world that puts hand railings on park benches so that those without a roof over their heads cannot lay down. You offer something radically different. You welcome us all, just as we are. You paint a picture of a world that could be. You remind us that there is enough love to go around, and that neighbors helping neighbors is who we are called to be. Thank you for the voice in the wilderness that calls to us. Thank you for the radical welcome and the unchanging love. Today, God, we give extra gratitude for the people and places that are home to us. But we also pray for those without a home. We pray for immigrants and refugees navigating the waters of trauma, change, and loss. We pray for those who experience homelessness and for those scraping together every coin to pay last month's rent. We pray for those who do not feel at home in their body, assign a gender or an identity that does not fit their spirit. We pray for those who do not feel at home in your church, wounded by strict rules or judgmental accusations. We pray for those who long to build a home with another, but instead find themselves eating another meal alone. God, there are so many who need a home, so help us be builders of that new day. Give us the courage of John, who saw a way forward so clearly. Turn your words into actions and our conviction into change. Gracious God, you are a God of open doors and welcome home celebrations. Teach us to be the same. And as we learn and as we grow, we continue to pray in the way of Jesus, saying, Our Heavenly Parent, our Mother, and our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass. Let us now 
Let us sing together our closing hymn, Voices United 48, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. in our hearts and within our faith community as we go out into the world. And as we go, may we know that the mystery that is the love of God, the compassion that is the peace of Jesus, and the companionship of the empowering Holy Spirit are with us now and always. Amen. Go out with great joy.